ever think that maybe you've gone too far for God to ever forgive you or use you or love you? Welcome to Through the Bible's Sunday Sermon. If you've been on the Bible bus recently, you know that we're traveling through the Old Testament books of Judges right now. Judges takes place during a really dark time in Israel's history. Very, very few people walked with God. And even those who did really messed up sometimes. They likely thought, as we do sometimes, How could God ever use a man or a woman like me? Samson was such a man. He was probably the most likely to succeed. God had given him unique gifts. He was poised to make a huge impact on his generation, but he had a weakness for women. He made their opinion and their favor too much of a priority in his life, and it drew him away from God. Dr. McGee will tell us more now in this sermon, the story of Samson. Let's commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, Reveal yourself through your word and give us eyes to see and hearts to obey your spirit's prompt in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. We turn tonight to the story of Samson, and I would like to turn to the 16th chapter of the book of Judges and begin reading at the fourth verse this very familiar incident. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us eleven hundred pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green with that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green with, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson, and he break the withs as a thread of tow is broken when it toucheth the fire. So his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new rope, that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then that, of course, is repeated, and let me drop down to save time. To verse 15, she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times, and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. It came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death, that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. 
Then the lords of the Philistines came up under her and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. She began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. I'll break off the reading at that particular juncture. This evening we're speaking on the subject of the secret of Samson's strength. The secret of Samson's strength. No other man in the Word of God, as far as I can tell, would be able to be a popular man today. Abraham, a man that is known more than any person that ever lived. Three great religions today go back to Abraham. Judaism, Mohammedanism, and Christianity. They all go back to this man. And more people have heard of Abraham than any man that ever lived. But if Abraham were present today, may I say to you, my friends, he would not be acceptable in this day and generation in which we live. He could not be a popular man by the standards by which he lived. You can take any other person. You can even take David with all of his faults. Yet here is a David, a man after God's own heart, a man who had a a real passion for God. He could never be popular in this day and generation. But this man, Samson, would be a popular man today, and I trust that we can see that this evening as we look at his life. Actually, there are three significant statements that we want to look at tonight. First, the secret of Samson's success. Second, the secret of Samson's strength. And third, the secret of Samson's sin. Now, will you tonight follow us? very carefully, as we look at this man, Samson, because more is given concerning him than any other of the judges. He's the last of the judges, could have been the greatest of the judges, but, of course, he was not. Will you notice the thing that is said concerning him in the 13th chapter, verse 5? Let me read. This is the word of the angel to the mother, to the parents of Samson. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistine. Now, that is the thing that is said concerning this man. He could have been the John the Baptist of the Old Testament, but he was not. He doesn't even compare to John the Baptist. But in his birth, there is a strange similarity. John the Baptist, before he was born, the Spirit of God came upon him, even in his mother's womb. That was true, if you please, of this man, Samson. Never was a man born with a more glorious opportunity than this man had. He actually had a silver spoon in his mouth, a spiritual silver spoon, if you please. Everything was propitious in his life for a glorious career, and a very brilliant future was before him. Before he's born, God marks him out. And God raised him up for a gigantic task, and that was to deliver Israel. May I say that the world today, and especially our nation, needs a man of this caliber, a man raised up of God, a man who stands for God, a God's man in this hour. And 
Samson was not that man in his day. He could have been. And unfortunately today, we do not have that man in this dark hour. Will you notice the condition of Israel at this time? In the first verse of the 13th chapter, we are told, The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. They needed a deliverer, and this man, Samson, was to be the one to deliver them out of the hand of the Philistines. And so the angel of God appeared unto Manoah and said to Manoah and his wife, they were barren just like the father and mother John the Baptist were, and told them that they were to have a son and that this son was to be a Nazarite and that the Holy Spirit of God would come upon him from the very beginning. Now, a Nazarite was one in Israel. It was a voluntary vow. No one had to take it. But there were many men and women in Israel who dedicated their lives to the service of God on a voluntary basis. And they took what was known as the Nazarite vow. It was a threefold vow, and it may sound strange to you tonight, but it had a very definite meaning. For instance, the first thing, they were not to touch strong drink. And it's not just because of the alcohol content. They were not to touch raisins. They were not to touch grapes. They were not to touch anything that came from the vine. And the reason for that was this, that the fruit of the vine always spoke to the nation Israel, and you find that uh, thought running as a thread through Scripture that it represents the joy of the Lord and uh, the fruit of the vine, the joy of the Lord. But the Nazarite was not to find his joy in anything on this earth. He's to find his joy in the things of God. He was a Nazarite. And this man, Samson, of all men, think of his life for just a moment. A man dedicated to God who was to find his joy in the things of God, and he never did find his his joy in the things of God, never in his life. He's always finding his joy in the things of this world. And he was the most unhappy man, most tragic man, you find in Scripture, there are a lot of Christians just like this today. They have been called to find the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. It's your portion, we're told. And Paul gave us a commandment to believers. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And that's not just uh, backslapping or laughing, that type of thing. You don't have to go around grinning like a Cheshire cat to reveal you have the joy of the Lord. It's not that type of thing. It's something that's down deep underneath, something that is very meaningful, if you please, something that the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, and it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Joy is number two, if you please. And that only can be given to us today of the Lord. Now, the Nazarite was to find his joy in the things of God and in God himself. That was the first thing. Then the second thing, he was not to cut his hair. That's a strange thing, is it not? He's not to cut his hair shaved. And Samson was a shaggy-looking fellow, by the way. He was no... I've never felt that he was a beauty. Great, as they've attempted to depict him today, and even the movies attempt to depict him as a great, big, strong, handsome fellow. He was the ugliest, strongest looking fellow you ever saw in your life. This fellow Sam. That was another thing. How in the world could a man like that be such a ladies' man? For he was that also. He was the ugliest looking and strawny looking, and he never had a haircut until Delilah gave him one, and he never had a, a shave until uh, she gave him one. And believe me, this man, that was the thing that the Nazarite was to do. Now, what did that mean? That means that uh, long hair for a man is a shame. It, for a woman, it's her glory. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Doth not nature itself teach you 
that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him? That's a verse I've always suggested should be posted down on Pershing Square. That's a, be a good verse for the square. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Now, uh, this man, any Nazarite, would be willing to bear shame for God. That is the whole point of it. He's to be odd. He's to be different. Now, John the Baptist was a Nazarite. That's the reason he looked as he did. And uh, we find that this man, Samson, he's one of the most outstanding of the Nazarites. Now, not only that, he was not the third thing, he was not to come near a dead body. And that means that no natural claim, in other words, when a loved one died, he was not to go to the funeral, have anything to do with it. In other words, no natural claim could make any demand upon him whatsoever. Now, Samson was a Nazarite. He was God's man. And that, my friend, is the secret of his success. He was raised up for a great purpose, and his success was in God. As he was dedicated to God, then he would be a success. And only as he performed his God-appointed task, but the thing that's said here, the first verse that I read, he shall begin to deliver Israel. He never did deliver Israel. He shall begin to deliver Israel. He was never a success, actually. Success knocked at his door. Opportunity knocked at his door. But this man, the best that could be said of him, he shall begin to deliver Israel. And he was just making a beginning. He was a beginner. He was in beginner's class. May I say there are a lot of Christians today that's just like this. They are jack of all trades, master and none. They, uh, they start well. Paul, you remember, wrote and said to the Corinthians, the Galatians, ye did run well. What did hinder you? You started out like a, like a house of fire, but uh, something has happened to you. Uh, what, what happened? Uh, I estimate conservatively this time in going through the Bible that we started out with 10,000 people plus reading through the Bible with us. One-fourth of those have already dropped by the wayside. They've already dropped by the wayside. They, uh, a great many Christians are like that. They're enthusiastic to begin something, but never go through with it. This man, Samson, here's a man called of God to a great task to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. And my friend, he could have done it. He didn't. He shall begin to deliver Israel. That's as far as he ever got. Many Christians are like that. They shall begin this. They begin something, but they never see it through. When the going gets hard and it gets rough and tough, and they find out that the burden is heavy and the days are long and the sun's beating down, they give up and they let go. Samson was that kind of a man. Now, that's the first thing we want to see. And now the second is the secret of Samson's strength. And this is very important. I turn to verse 25 of this 13th chapter, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. The secret of Samson's strength was not in his arms. Although I've seen pictures of him, boy, I tell you, he could make this fellow Hargate look like a little puny fellow. But actually, the strength was not in his arms. Although he killed a thousand Philistines at one time with them. Samson's strength was not in his back. Although he carried the gates of Gaza on his back. And when, will you listen very carefully? Samson's strength was not in his hair, although he was weak when that was gone. He was a Nazarite, dedicated to God. And that was the badge. The hair was the badge of his vow. When he lost his badge, he's weak. 
Can he's weak because the Spirit of God had departed from him? Is weak because, my beloved, his only strength was in the Spirit of God and was never, never in his hair. He had no power or strength in that hair at all. It's merely superstition to think that because he had long hair, he was strong. Now, this man, Samson, he's been depicted as a big bruiser, a fellow with muscle. He's, the, he's not really that. May I say to you tonight that Samson is the biggest sissy in the Bible or out of the Bible. His name means little son, S-U-N. He was the first one to go into orbit, but he didn't do very well. Little son. That's all in the world. May I say he was never the strong man in the circus. He was the midget in the circus. He was, uh, he was really a weakling. Uh, every place you see him here, you, you can't admire him at all. He went, for instance, down one time and he went to Timnath. Samson went down to Timnath and he saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. He came up and told his father and his mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. What a sissy. He didn't have nerve enough to go and ask the girl to marry him. He said to mom and papa, you go down and get her for me. What kind of a strong man is that? May I say to you, he had long hair like a woman. He was a riddle maker. Always making riddles. You'll find as you go through, he's always making a riddle. One time he killed a lion. He came back and he shouldn't have gone to that carcass, but he came back to it. Something had eaten the carcass of the lion and a, and a hive of bees went there and had made honey. And he got the best riddle of his life. And he had to, he had to give out the little riddle. He was great at that sort of thing. Always pressed playing pranks like a schoolboy. Never did grow up. He took the gates of Gaza just like a college student, put them on his back and carried them off. Those are pranks you play when you're in school. Not a grown man called a God to deliver Israel. But he's a sissy. And he allowed every woman to make a fool of him. And they did. He's not a he-man. He's not the strongest man, but he's the weakest man in the Word of God. You seem to sometimes see the picture on the bottle of vitamins before taken. Some little dried up anemic fella, and then you see the picture of the fella after he takes one bottle. Oh boy, what bulging muscles he's got. What a robust figure the fella has. Now, a great many people think Samson's the picture after you take the vitamins. He's the fella before you take the vitamins. He's a little dried-up shrimp. That's all in the world that he ever was. Little son. <laughs> little bitty fella. And that's the reason that they marvel that this man is. How can this little dried-up fella be so strong? And he couldn't be. That's the reason God today has to make some of us mighty weak before he can use us. To let us know and to let the world know that it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit saith the Lord. We are told that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And when the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, he was strong. And that's the secret of his strength. The world is always looking for strong things. That's the reason they wanted to know his strength. And God chooses the weak things. We saw a man this morning a despised man. God chooses, he says, the despised. He chooses the weak. And these are illustrations of that. If God wants that kind of a man, and he chose this little fellow, weakling, if you please, and God made him strong. He was the hero of his day. It's always the sign of a decadent age when men turn to the physical and put the emphasis on the physical. I do not want to call names tonight, but who are you present-day heroes? None of our scientists, no statesman, or no great preacher today is a hero. 
who are the hero, the baseball player, the wrestler, the fighter, the runner. It's all physical today. And I listened the other night on TV to the interview of a baseball player and the interview of a uh, fighter. It was interesting. Both of them murdered the English language. It was, uh, it was a, atrocious, uh, the way they handled the English language. And they made it very clear that the only thing that they were interested in, as one of them said, the moolah, <laughs> that's the hero of the hour. Samson would have made a good hero for the hour in which we live, because they like strong things. Believe me, friends, when the Spirit of God came upon this man, he was a strong man. They wanted to know the secret of his strength, but the interesting thing is that the secret of his strength was the Spirit of the Lord that came upon him. Now will you notice the secret of Samson's sin? And I turn to just one verse again, and that's the 20th verse of the 16th chapter that we read in your hearing at the beginning. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. He awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not. That's old Elizabethan English means and he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. I think that's the most tragic statement that you'll find in the Bible. Certainly it's the most tragic statement about Samson. You see this man, every time that he wanted to move, the Spirit of God had come upon him. But he kept playing, he kept trifling, and one day he went out. And he thought the Spirit of God would move up through him again. But he knew not the Spirit of God was departed from him. How tragic it is. That's the failure in his life. Now will you notice it very carefully here in closing. It says concerning Delilah, it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman. That was the undoing of Samson. That's the story of his life. He loved a woman. No man falls suddenly. No man has ever fallen suddenly. It's always gradual. And you go back and look at this man's story. He began that same way. He went down in the Philistine country. He should have gone down to deliver. Instead of delivering, he sees a Philistine woman in Timnath. Comes back and says to Papa and Mama, I want you to get her. And they tried to get him not to. They say, why don't you marry one of the Hebrew women? Why go down and get a Philistine, an enemy? Oh, he says, I want her. I like her. You go get her for me. And they went down. He's a pampered boy. And they go down and get her. Well, he didn't keep her long, because he's always playing tricks, by the way, and he, oh, he had a good one there. We won't go into detail tonight, but my, he really played some tricks there with the Philistines. And he would have his fun. He got some foxes when they made him angry, and he, he tied some firebrands to the tails of the foxes. Isn't that fun? And turn them loose in the wheat of the Philistines. May I say to you, he didn't, he never did deliver Israel. He, he never, he never caused people to rally to him. He never raised an army. He never did anything. He loved a woman. That was his weakness. That was his downfall. May I say to you, he'd be popular today. We're living in a day that Dr. Sor uh, Soroykin, at Harvard University, has made this statement. He says, if more and more individuals are brought up in this sex-saturated atmosphere, then without doubt and moral restraint, then without deep and moral restraint, they will become rudderless folks controlled only by the wind of their environment. I've been reading a very fine book on this particular subject. Why today that we're having so much divorce? I think it goes back 
to the fact that it's such a tremendous emphasis on sex. That this stimuli has been given such a tremendous emphasis that two young people do not actually have a chance to really fall in love. They do not have a chance to, to respect each other and to admire each other. Why any boy, when he's 16, 17, 18 years old, he wants to worship a girl. And today, they have gone too far. And as a result, the girl hates herself. Of course she does. Has to. Especially if she's had any kind of Christian upbringing. And the boy will despise himself. And as a result, if they marry, they marry on such a low plane that there is not there that real love that binds them together. Oh, Samson knew a great deal about sex. He knew nothing about marital love. He sure would make a hit to death. May I say to you, this man made a fool of himself with Delilah, or I should say that she made a fool of him. If this was bound to happen as it's bound to happen to any man in his life. Whatever that weakness is will eventually be the thing that will destroy him. There came the day when he saw Delilah, and she was really a match for Samson, the only one that he ever met that was a match for him. He fell in love with her, and he married her. She was a, a woman of the Philistines. And the lords of the Philistines came to her, and they said to her, We want to get at this man, and you are our way of getting at him. We've got to find out the secret of his strength. We know it's not in his muscles. We know it's not in his back. We know that it's not a physical strength. We know that he's being given a strength, and we'd like to know the secret of it. And so she begins to work upon him. And you know, <laughs> Samson's always going to play. He says, uh, if you will tie me with some brand new ropes, then you'll get me. <laughs> he wanted to have his fun, and he began to play. And so uh, they tied him up. And then she said, Samson, the Philistines are on you. Oh, how fun he had. He broke them, and boy, the Philistines really took to the tall timber. And then she came to him, and she began to pout. She said, you don't love me. Now you, If you love me, you'd tell me. And she kept after him, and he tricked her again. <laughs> he tricked her the third time, but the third time he's weakening. He said, if you time her hair... It's getting close now. And finally, after this third attempt, and he had deceived all three times, he just broke down and she says, she used the greatest weapon that women have, a tear. He began to weep. And she says to him, she said, you know, you, uh, you really don't love me. If you love me, you tell me. And he, uh, like a fool, he began now, he can't, endure this any longer. He's got to tell her. And so he told her. And believe me, she saw that he had opened up his heart, that he had really told everything that was in his heart. And he told it. He sat down to the Philistines. She says, you can come up now. We got him. You can be sure of one thing. That this man has told me everything. They came up and they had the barber there, and they really trimmed him. Now, my beloved, when he lost his hair, that is not the sign of his weakness. That is not the fact that he was weak. The fact of his weak weakness is this. He says, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. That's all he had to do. But this time, and he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. And that was the thing that made him weak. May I say to you, this man kidded with her at first and played. And finally, he opens up his heart like a fool. Kipling, I think, has described this. The fool there was, 
And he made his prayer, even as you and I, upon a rag of bone and a hank of hair. He called her his lady fair, but we call her the woman who did not care. That's Delilah. That's Samson, if you please. That's their story. She never, she never knew much about love, and he didn't know much about love. They really didn't love each other. They knew a great deal about sex, but nothing about love. And she deceived him. Now he's weak as that other man. And they come in and take him, and they put out his eyes. I think Samson and another man who fell the same way, Solomon, are the two most tragic men in the entire Word of God. No two men ever had the opportunity that they had. This man, think of it, my beloved, called to deliver Israel. But he's a carnal judge. He has a weakness. He never raised an army. He never won a battle. He never rallied his people. His eyes were put out, and he's now led into captivity because the Spirit of God has departed from him. Now I want to conclude. May I conclude like this? There's a tremendous comparison of Samson to our Lord. The birth of both of them was told by an angel. Both of them were separated to God. Both of them were a Nazarite. Both of them were mighty to save. Both of them were rejected by his people. Both of them destroyed their enemies in their death. But the way I say that the comparison ends there, from there on it's a contrast. The prince of this world cometh, our Lord said, and findeth nothing in me. He found something in Samson. Christ on the cross said, Father, forgive them. Samson said, when he stretched out his arms in the temple of Dagon on the pillars, he says, O oh God, avenge me. Christ's arms were stretched in love. The arms of Samson were stretched in wrath. Samson died. Christ lived. Somebody says, but the day of Samson is gone, and we're living in a different day. Yes, that's true. In that day, the Spirit of God came upon man and left man. That's not true today. David could pray at the time of his sin, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. No Christian will ever have to pray that. The minute that you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. But you and I can grieve and quench the Holy Spirit until he absolutely becomes inoperative in our lives. And I'm confident today that there are many Christians that have played and toyed with sin so long that never again will the Spirit of God use them. I talked to a minister not long ago. He's in his 50s. He says, God's through with me. You bet he is. He told me his story. He says, God is through with me, and there is a sin unto death. You can so play and toy with sin, my beloved, until the Spirit of God is no longer operative in your life. He won't leave you. If you're God's child, you've been once born again, but you can reach the place. And then, my beloved, may I say to you tonight, if you are here an unsaved person, or if you're listening in tonight to this message, you can listen to the gospel, and you can trifle with the gospel. And there comes a day, oh, God's mercy never reaches the limit. God's grace is always extended. But you can reach a place psychologically where no longer you can make a decision for Christ. I talked to a man, he was in a cult, and I won't mention the cult. And he said to me on his deathbed, he said, I have so played and so toyed with this that, Dr. McGee, I know you are presenting the gospel to me, but I cannot truthfully and honestly, sincerely believe. When I say I believe, I don't know whether I do or not. Have you reached that place? 
I've done you an awful injustice tonight if you are here and have rejected Jesus Christ. And you go out of here tonight rejecting him. And I'll tell you why. Because next time it'll be easier. And even when Billy Graham gets here next year for a meeting, the chances are you'll go by curiosity to hear Billy Graham, but you'll walk out of there and not be saved. You mean God's grace can't reach you? Oh, yeah. You mean God's not merciful? Yeah, he's merciful. But my friend, you've played and toyed with this thing and heard it so much that you reach the place where you can't be sincere. Just a sound. A playboy, if you please. Treating in a supercilious manner the things of God, a man that the Spirit of God came upon with mighty power. He could lift the gates of Gaza. He could slay a thousand Philistines. God have mercy on us when we have power like that. And we fritter it away. And we start making jokes. And having our little fun and treating these sacred things as if they're commonplace. God have mercy on us if we're doing that tonight. Because you can keep playing at this thing, my brother, my sister, until the day comes. You will be as hard as night. Never, never able to turn to him. He'll save you if you turn, but you won't turn. You'll be like Sam, trifling, playing, having your fun, treating in a supercilious manner, acting as if this is commonplace. Well, that's a wake-up call. The question that we each should ask is, are we taking God seriously? No playing games or posing or posturing, as Dr. McGee said. If you don't know God, then turn to Him today. Dr. McGee gave several messages that you need to read or hear about what it means to have a relationship with God. Go to ttb.org and click on the banner, How Can I Know God? Or if you'd prefer, we'd be glad to put a few of these resources in the mail to you. Give us a call at 1-800-652-4253. Or you can email us at biblebus at ttb.org. Now, if you know Jesus is your Savior, but Samson's story maybe rang a little too clearly to you, then today is a great day to turn back to God. Ask His forgiveness. He's waiting with open arms right now. Dr. McGee told Samson's story in more detail in his book, Real Characters, which is available to you for $5. It's a huge savings this summer, while supplies last. In Real Characters, Dr. McGee gives us insight into Samson, as well as other people that we've met in our recent time in the books of Joshua and Judges. Here's the list of character studies included in Real Characters. You'll meet Jacob, Joshua, Caleb, Samson, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, Hosea, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Nicodemus, Stephen, and Saul, Agrippa, and Cornelius. That's a great lineup. This summer's inventory clearance includes all of Dr. McGee's topical books and paperback commentaries, by the way, all for $5 each. Here are just a few. More Real Characters, which includes 10 more character studies, Doctrine for Difficult Days, Feasting on the Word, Marriage and Divorce, J. Vernon McGee on Comfort, a great book for anyone who has or is suffering, and even more. You'll find the whole list online at ttb.org or just give us a call. There's no limit to how many you can buy, so consider what books your friends at church or neighbors would benefit from reading. Or maybe make a gift of these books by Dr. McGee to your church or local library. You can order at ttb.org or by calling 1-800-652-4253. That's the number to call, too, if you'd like to purchase a CD copy of today's sermon, The Story of Samson. And when you call, it'd be really helpful to us to know how you listen to Through the Bible, whether that's online, on the radio, using the flash drive or solar Bible bus, or maybe some other way. Thanks. Well, with full confidence in God's loving character, we pray that he will fill you with his grace, mercy, and peace as you walk with him this week. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.